Hello, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Matt Williamson back here with my guest, Anthony Rotuno, and we have been talking a little bit about uh, Peter Jackson's Get Back. This is the part two video, and we're going to start off by talking about a book that I've brought up in some other videos I've done on really utilizing the Niagara Reels to, to understand what was going on during these sessions, and that is this book here. It's called Get Back, the Unauthorized Chronicle of the Beatles' Let It Be Disaster. And I had to go at the authors, Doug Sulpe and Ray Schweigert for calling it a disaster. Because if you add up what the accomplishments were at the end of January, it's quite the opposite of a disaster. I mean, you had three number one songs, an album, a film, a documentary 50 years later, a, a Grammy winning song, demos for Abbey Road and then several solo albums and the list goes on. Yeah. So Anthony. Tell me what you think about where this fits into the whole thing now, because I, I it's it's still an incredibly important piece of work, and I highly recommend anybody get this book because it catalogs mm. the sessions wonderfully in print. Well, first of all, apologies to Mr. Schweigert, because I've been calling this a Doug Sulpey book for about the last four years, yes. purely because his name is so much easier to say. So let me just say the, that first. I'll call it the Schweigert Selby book from now okay. on. Okay, Schweigert yeah. Selby book. All right. Um, well, I I got that book. I don't know when that book came out. I must have got it 20 years ago, a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And I've actually read it all the way through three times, mm -hmm. I think. And let me give them some credit, first of all. If you think about how dry the book could have been, I mean, you're just talking about, I mean, one of the things I remember, correct me if I'm wrong, but they sort of list every performance, even if it's just like a two second, they say, oh, John plays right. three horrible guitar notes and then that's mm -hmm, it. You know? So rather like we said about, about Peter Jackson, to write a book with, you know, where you're detailing this sort of band jamming through loads of stuff, some of it uninspiring, some of it more inspiring, you have to put some drama in it. So I'll defend them to a point. The other thing about it is, it's funny that before I read Tune In, Lois's book in 2000, I read it in 2014, I almost felt like we'd reached some kind of end point. I was, and I remember thinking at the time, oh, you know, I, I know everything about the Beatles. Why do I need to read this Tune In? And then when you read Tune In and then everything else that's come since, we've entered this basically a golden age. And then obviously there's podcasts, there's YouTube channels. So we've, we've now, that's why we're drinking, we're drinking ourselves sober because there's so many people reassessing. I think once upon a time, whenever that book came out, mm -hmm. was that the nineties? Was it the nineties? I think I it's like 20 it years old. Uh, let me have a quick yeah. look here. I'd say more actually. It's, probably... it's been reissued a few times. I've got a copyright 1994. No, oh, there you go. Yeah. Mid nineties. Yeah. Around mm -hmm. the time of anthology, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so I defend them on that, but, um, since I since I've seen the film, I actually just dug the book out. Um, no pun intended, Doug. Sorry, I dug dug it out about a week ago, and I had a little flick through it. And there's a lot of conjecture, um, and I believe that they didn't have access to the video files, so they were going right. by the audio, which is right. fair enough. Yep. But there's, there's bits where they say, you know, of all this disastrous month, this is probably the worst performance ever. And like I said, they have these performances of four seconds. Oh, John plays some horrible solo or something. And John wasn't a great lead guitarist. He had to work his solos out. Um, and there's, I think we're all guilty of overanalyzing. And there's bits where they say, Paul sounds disinterested. And there was actually a bit that I actually followed in the book and in the Nagra reels. And I got a very, very different impression. Yes. And this thing about sort of yawning, uh, you can hear Paul yawning. Or even on the get back, when Paul's doing get back, George is, place. Yawning. George is yawning, but it's 10 o'clock in the morning. There's nothing necessarily to read into that. It's a night I, owl at 10 yes. o'clock in the morning. It's funny yeah. how some writers will take every yawn and it'll equate to boredom. And that's just not how life yeah. is, you know? So I think yeah. that's, you know, it's a, it's a yeah. judgment call that, I mean, I'm, I'm sure they were bored lots of the times and not yawning and vice versa. So, you know. Yeah, it's like sometimes, well, I'll give you an example. Sometimes I sit like this. Because it's mm -hmm. comfortable, or because I'm cold. Mm -hmm. but arms folded is negative body language. You know, I must yeah. be bored. I must be subliminally yeah. feeling all kinds of uh, 
you know, antagonism towards the person talking, but it's not always the case. And I'm as guilty as anyone of overanalyzing. So I'm not having a go at anyone, but yeah, I mean, uh, my whole, <laughs> all my mental <laughs> stuff is an overanalyzation, and some of course. Fine, but it's not enough for me. I never will analyze, I'll keep going. Yeah, it's good fun as well, remember. Um, so I don't want to have too much a go at Mr. Schweiger and Mr. Solpe, but I think all, all to say that you can't take that book as the Bible of January 69. The other thing about it, is it right? Am I right in thinking the front cover of the one I had is that famous shot of them in the control boom? Remember, and someone's got their feet up on the control desk. Yeah. Um, Am I, I right I, in thinking? Sorry, go, go. I've got two different copies. So I've got this one mm -hmm. and the original title, which was called Drugs, Divorce, and a Slipping Image, That's right. which is just a no photo on that cover. And I'm, I forget right. which ones came out when. So I mean, there might have been a third cover. could very well be. Yeah, I mean, definitely the cover is a famous shot. You must have seen the shot of sure. the five of them, and they all look. They look George is looking boring. away. Yeah, but I'm sure someone, I heard someone talking recently, they're probably screaming at us now saying, yes, it was me, um, mm -hmm. that they were just listening to a playback. And someone made a very good point. That if you're just sitting like this, I could easily look like I'm annoyed or bored if I'm just looking. The way we look normally when we're concentrating on something is not, again, it's not so much to read into it. And I believe, in fact, that must be an apple, isn't it, that picture? Because I recognize that yes. control room. Yeah. So they were getting on well then. So again, you know, it's using a great deal of conjecture, but it's still a damn good book. I mean, it was a damn, it was a real achievement to make anything interesting out of what's really quite a dry subject matter if you think about it. Yeah, and one of the you things know? that I, I have to give these guys credit for is the fact that they were not allowed to quote any of the tapes. All right. right. They could only summarize because I think if I remember the story correctly, I think they had approached Apple to get some clarification or some licensing, something or another. And Apple said, oh no, we're not gonna let you quote anything. So yeah. they had to create this whole book and, and put it in a summary form. So yeah. it's impossible to get away from some editorializing if you're forced to do that. So I'll give them that. Um, but, and, and you said earlier something about, uh, did you say like creating some drama when you're doing a book or a film? How did you put yeah. that? Yeah. I mean, any, anything, you know, a, a book, a film, even a documentary. Yeah. Well, well me... it's a, no, I was just going to say, essentially, let's say you're making a film as in a film with actors. It's a slightly different thing, mm -hmm. but you know, I, I studied a little bit of screenwriting when I was younger. And, and one of the things you always need is conflict. You know, even if it's a feel good film, even if it's mm -hmm. a rom-com with a happy ending, most stories, if you want to call it that, need conflict. So I don't, again, they're, they're doing something necessary. Peter Jackson created conflict by saying, well, the Beatles have got this crazy schedule. They don't know what they're doing. That That's ne not necessarily conflict between them, but that's that's creating drama in the sense of they're the biggest band in the world and they're about to lay a massive egg if they don't get their shit together, you know? So that's all I was saying, yeah. Yeah, in this book, um, there's a, on the back, cover of this you know there's some quotes from some various publications saying nice things about it but there's a paragraph here that says at, at the end of the paragraph for years people have asked why the Beatles broke up here finally is the answer so this might be a put some publishing hype that's making some very big claims but in the in the foreword of the book something similar is said what drove the most popular and prolific prolific rock and roll group in history to his disintegration. What happened? How did it fall apart? Welcome to the get back sessions. So they're drawing some conclusions here that I don't agree with and that, that the evidence doesn't quite support. I mean, if you had this kind of sure. information for every album, you'd find the same exact arguments probably time and time again, you know, because yeah. the these guys work with one another. But that's, you know, again, this is from 1994. And in those days we had the anthology was a big deal, but now that just seems dated and, and just a blip. Yeah, here. it's sort of a, yeah, what what they call it now on the internet is clickbait, isn't it? It's, it's you know, because I, I, I've done a little bit of work in alternative media, you know, and you've worked with James Corbett, for example, you know, he's, mm -hmm. he's really looking at non-mainstream media views of the world. And there's so many videos now that say the truth about, you know, and it, it's very clickbaity. So yes, I think that, yeah, it's marketing, you know, you're a marketing guy, right? So they're, they're selling mm -hmm. a book, you know, sometimes, you know, 
I think we're all probably a bit more cynical nowadays, but let's say 10 years ago on the internet, if you put a video of the truth about, you know, if you said something like, oh, this is the truth about the world or something, you know, you get, you'd get hundreds of thousands of clicks that people are like thirsting. They're like, oh, someone's going to give me the truth, you know. And um, so I think, you know, I'd give them, I'd give them a bit of, cut them a bit of slack for that. But uh, yeah. I, I still would recommend that book for sure, as you said, you know, but yeah, I mean, so far as I mean, it's the best documentation of the proceedings of all of that. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think um, I think it's a, a valuable piece. And I think it's a necessity if you want to understand these sessions better. This is a great help. Like I've been saying, the Peter Jackson film documentary is just one of the pieces to help us understand these sessions better. You've got videos out there that I've done that are more focused on the Nagra reels. You've got books like this Schweigert Selfie book. There's You've got the original Lindsay Hogg film. You've got the album. So it all works together, I think. Yeah. It's all part of a puzzle that will, quite frankly, never be completed. Yeah, I, I think I've mentioned this on Glass Onion a few times as well. I look at it now as, as almost like it's like a, a mystery that you go through forensically. Yeah. And the fun of it is, the fun of it for me is that, is that, I'll, I'll probably spend the rest of my life, you know, I don't, I don't spend too much time on it, but for the rest of my life, I'll probably be, you know, we'll be picking up bits of evidence from that month. And it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. And one of the things of, of it is that most of it is audio, you know? Yeah. We've got lots of video now, which is absolutely great. I love it. But mm. there's, a, there's, a, I mean, I, I was, when I was a kid, if I could just say this, mm-hmm. obviously I watched TV like anyone else, but I grew up fascinated by radio as my, my mother's, always been fascinated by radio as well so i like that mystery element of audio where you know, you have no idea like you can't see the body language you can't see this so i enjoy that i enjoy the mystery part mm-hmm. and i think it would almost be boring if we if we finally knew the truth you know mm-hmm. then then paul mccartney even said this once i remember listening to a radio special he said if you knew if you knew the meaning of life uh, what would be the point of getting up tomorrow? You know, <laughs> it's a really cool quote. Good I love point. That. Yeah, a good yeah point. so I, I really enjoy that. Yeah, I love that mystery element. And I think January 69 of all the Beatles things has, not, has become probably my, my favourite thing to study. Yes. Because we've got I so agree. much of it, but it's so elusive at the same time. It I love is it. elusive. That's a good point. Good point. <laughs> and, um, yes. Yeah. Well, well, let's move on to the next thing. Another uh topic that's quite elusive and that is john lennon and the drug use during this time because much conjecture has been made uh we got to see some things firsthand and you've talked about this on glass onion um we've talked about it when discussing the joe gooden book called riding so high Mm. what did you take away from john's drug use or, or alleged drug use during these 30 days in january after seeing the peter jackson film yeah, this is very interesting for me because it's a topic we've covered a lot on my podcast. Um, well, first of all, I think, again, as much as we can debunk things, and this has obviously opened up more questions than answers, but it's, you know, the idea that he's just strung out on heroin for the whole of January is clearly not true. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, the second time I watched Get Back, uh, I don't know if you noticed this, but there's a point where he actually asks someone for some pet pills. Mm-hmm. which is essentially speed, which is what they're taking in Hamburg. And I think, I think as time goes, as time has gone on, uh, again, people who study the Beatles, we've kind of lost this more innocent view that you generally start with, you know, mm-hmm. the mainstream view. And I think we, I think most people would agree that Beatlemania, for example, was, was fueled a lot by speed, you know, mm-hmm. others. Um, and we know that they was going around, you know, with the Who and the whole mod scene and all that. Oh, yeah. You know, because people say, oh, how do the Beatles get all that energy? And I'm not saying they didn't have a lot of energy, but there's something at play. And what I noticed, the second time I watched it, I followed John, obviously, because I have a, something of a special interest in him. And I think, I think he was high most of the time, to be perfectly honest. However, I think he was engaged. So I think maybe, you know, he was doing a little bit of uppers and maybe smoked a joint here and there. He was obviously doing heroin. Mm -hmm. He has one big night, you know, that he comes back on the 14th and we know all about the two chunkies thing. Yes. The the bit where he's saying to Paul and George, oh, you know, sorry I'm late. I was stoned and watching films last night. He's just talking to them like, you know, they always like, does he remember there's a camera? He doesn't care after a while. It's just, 
he and, wants to tell his mates what he was up to and... yeah i think the john says yeah basically i was up partying or having a, a some kind of party knowing it was some kind of drug yeah using drugs and mccartney says oh, mr lennon do we have to yeah. wear this public i thought that was right exactly and i, I yeah. just love how they dance around it and but do it dance in the open essentially i think that's kind yeah. of cool. because it wasn't I, more it was a more innocent time at that time you could get away with saying that now and be acceptable mm-hmm. back then you had to dance around it and they they were about the best dancers there were <laughs> yeah yeah but um yeah, I suppose with the clarity of this picture, I was looking at John Lennon. I was thinking, he doesn't really look too healthy. He's very pale. I mean, obviously, he'd done however many LSD trips. And I'm sorry to say, and this just came out of John Lennon's mouth, you know, he was always on something. And in yeah. a funny way, he was almost defined by drugs. Obviously, he's defined also by the talent and the songwriting mm-hmm. and the sense of humor and the great personality. But, you know, if you really trace his life, and I've done this a lot on the podcast, you know, he was, he was, so you say a stoner in the midst well obviously there was speed there was drink then there was marijuana then there was heroin and coke as well and then he sort of went in these cycles yeah so to answer the question i'd say it's not one thing or another it's too simple to say he was strung out but it's too simple to say oh he was like really high on life and engaged because i look at yeah. him closely and he's probably high most of the time just depends on on what you know what yeah peter jackson had talked about um i forget what podcast it was but he was discussing how the Beatles would all excuse themselves and he thought they were going to smoke a joint come back a little giddy yeah. there was also they would break after lunch they might drink yes so there was times when the drinking might yield uh rehearsal takes the one as good but the exactly. mood might lighten so exactly. it's a give and take you know so I always find it interesting how with regard to rock stars because we've got rock and roll really since the mid fifties till the present time, how some people's view of drugs are wholly negative and some are wholly positive. In other words, I think both of those are wrong, but I, you know, some people who want to glorify the drugs and say, well, that's it's so good to look at all this great music. If they're attributing it to the drugs. Mm-hmm. Now in the case of get back, I agree. I think Lennon was clearly not healthy i mean he, there's days where he, he came he, his hair was not washed you could tell and you can tell when it was washed yeah and uh he made a joke about it something about uh wearing the same clothes to maintain co- film continuity which i thought was yeah. hilarious that was really funny yeah it was great and um so he has a, he's the guy is aware he knows what he's doing and just doesn't care or just doing it anyway yeah. but um there's times when uh, he clearly is the leader of the band I don't know how high one would be in doing that, but I mean, he's there's times near the end in the Apple portion, he is the bona fide de facto leader of that band. And Paul knows that he even says it, you're the boss. And that happened. That's probably still right up to this day, even though we lost him 40 some years ago. And it, I mean, and you can still be the boss and be high, but I, I think, yeah, I think the truth is somewhere in the middle, and it, it didn't seem. There's times when it may have, may have taken away from the proceedings, particularly at Twickenham when there was they were less productive. They could have used that leadership far more because to put yeah. it on Paul's shoulders is not fair. There's no Jordan the, Martin there, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think I think a lot of it. The problem is, is with drugs. A lot of it is like the is the media representation of it. Yeah. Where you know you'll have legislators who've never done it, never smoked a joint or done anything in their life judging people for taking drugs and not looking at the reasons why, et cetera. But I won't get into that now, but yeah, to say that I'm somewhere in the middle as well. I mean, when I was young, I had LSD experiences, mushrooms and things, and the experience you can gain if you're, if you're kind of looking for it, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you can, you can do hallucinogens and just giggle for 10 hours and have a great time. That's fine. But if you're the kind of person who is looking a little bit deeper, is trying to sort of squeegee their third eye, as Bill Hicks used to say, Mm. something like lsd that that is going to change your songwriting you know obviously yeah. it's not going to create lucy in the sky with diamonds or i am the walrus but you know i think i think john lennon uh used drugs for various reasons you know you, you probably use pet pills to get him up in the morning and um, yeah uh and then the lsd has a certain use and then you know other drugs relax you i mean let me, let me say, I just uh, just happened to watch uh, a couple of days ago the film Judy, you know, with Renee Zellweger playing Judy Garland. 
I've never seen that. Right, it's a very recent film. It's mm. very good, actually. She did a great job. But, mm. you know, compared to Judy Garland, John, John Lennon wasn't doing too badly, you know. Cause <laughs> Judy yeah. Garland was in, I mean, basically, she was put, I mean, this is child abuse, basically. When she was 15, yeah. the studios were putting her on uppers, they're putting her on speed and then giving her sleeping pills to get her to sleep. So yeah, I think John Lennon was in a better place than, say, Judy Garland or Marilyn Monroe or something like that. But, you know, like just to say that I think he, he did look, I think he was a person who, I mean, you can almost say that about anyone. I mean, most people have coffee in the morning, right? And sure. some people would drink chamomile tea to get them to sleep. That's a lot, that's a lot less harmful than heroin, clearly. But it is kind of what people do, you know. We, we all use drugs, but probably the majority of people would use illegal drugs. So, Yeah, the 20th century yeah. certainly was the century of drug taking. And right. the, like the Stone song, Mother's Little Helper, was a reflection of, you know, post-war amphetamine and uppers and downers that was Absolutely. pretty common. And mm -hmm. I think it took rock music to glorify the drug taking to a point of extreme recreation because Hollywood never did that. Right. And the housewives that, are, that was taking this stuff, it was kept to themselves. I don't think there was ever a glorification, but rock music and the media that came along with it the pop culture seemed to really glorify it in a way that maybe created more chaos and mayhem. But I, you can't say that about a lot of other things, I don't think, in terms of glorifying drugs. I mean, it, it's more on the down low. I think probably among musicians, I think probably having a, having beers together or smoking a joint together is probably going to bond you, you know. But yeah. then, you know, I've... I've read plenty of books about rock stars who got into heroin. It's pretty nasty business. It's not. It's, yeah, I suppose it's very yeah. unglamorous. Very yeah. unglamorous. Yes, yeah, you know, as you as you said that thing about John Lennon. That I'm not going to say that points to heroin use, but lack of personal hygiene is one of the first things that happens when someone gets into really hard stuff. Like yeah, I just did a podcast about Nick Drake. And oh. A lot of a lot of him that points possibly okay. to heroin. Okay. Don't tell his yeah. family that they don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah just to, but to say you know john john was definitely more engaged and when you say he's a leader i think i think he i think he had the choice of being the leader because he was although ringo was the oldest of those three you know the creative brothers let's say the three i think paul and george did look up to him but yeah. i think paul just seemed to have more energy at that time he probably was perhaps he was more of more kind of comfortable with getting up early in the morning it might even be something as silly as that you know he was perhaps more of an early bird who knows but and uh, add, yeah mm. to add to that i would also say where john when he wasn't being the leader and a leader was needed and paul was flailing mm. and ringo kind of had his place as a silent leader of sorts yeah this was an opportunity for george to step up and fill that vacuum and he didn't really do that I, obviously he had things in his personal life going on but maybe yeah. I'm suggesting, as I hear myself say this, that maybe George Harrison wasn't a leader. And that's why yeah. the role he had in the Beatles was what it was. And felt that, you know, obviously as he grew as a songwriter, not being a leader harmed him maybe more than his songwriting skills. Or, I mean, I, I think that's maybe one of the th reasons why he struggled is because he wasn't a leader. I th yeah, I would I would say that for sure. Yeah, I mean, um, when he, he didn't tour much, but seventy four we know didn't go so well, and even nineteen ninety two, you know, and even Bangladesh as well. I think he was very, <clears throat> he was lucky, or he chose for all things was past and Bangladesh. He chose people that kind of loved him or really liked him, and they were kind of people like Billy Preston. I mean, we we knew that already, but mm -hmm. he's such a great guy to have around because he's got tons of positive energy. And he just seems like a, I mean, to be honest, if you look into Billy Preston's life, he had a bit of some dark stuff going on later. Yeah. But at that point, you know, that sort of late 60s, early 70s, I think George surrounded himself with some some good people who sort of liked him and everything. And, but yeah. yeah, it doesn't strike me, it doesn't strike me as a leader. So you, you, you sort of start to think, what would he have really liked in the Beatles? And I think what he liked was, that, as I said, those periods I was saying earlier, where the three of them are working on songs and they're kind of leaving their ego at the door and saying, you know, this is, I think he just wanted a three-way partnership. You know? I think he did. And I think he, he didn't get it from a uh, 
composing a royalty standpoint, which is a shame. You know, God, how how would have that band if 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 Lennon and McCartney weren't so prolific so quickly? Uh, could there have been a four-way writing credit that would have changed everything? But maybe it would have been worse yeah. because if you got Lennon and McCartney doing most of the heavy lifting, and well, Ringo's getting a full quarter, and he's not doing, he's not writing any, you know. So I mean, who's to say? I mean, Matt, how, how many groups have broken up over songwriting credits? <laughs> I mean, it's, hap- it's happening every one of them, <laughs> except the Rolling Stones. Well, they, they, well, arguably, they did split up a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Wyman quit in the '90s, I think, but um. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, Wyman yeah. wrote the Jumpy Jack Flash lick. Just he did. He example. wrote the lick. He got no credit. Yeah, no, Brian Jones wrote, wrote some original nothing on the label. There. Exactly. Yeah. So I think I think to answer your question, I think it was they just decided on that for simplicity. You know, Lennon McCartney. Yeah. Should we have George in? Yeah, maybe not. You know. Yeah, I think, like I said, they were prolific so early, and one of the things mm. that Mark Lewison uncovered was some some contractual stuff that. Brian uh, Epstein managed Lennon McCartney se- separately as songwriters. Oh, so right. there was a there was a, um, a, a desire probably on Epstein's part to push them, much like um, Albert Grossman was pushing Dylan's work because he got a chunk of the publishing for of sure. Dylan's work. So so that that riff began very early, but we can see why it started because Lennon yeah. McCartney just went came like gangbusters out of the gates. And by 64, 60, 64, George was saying, well, I don't really want to write. We've got two great writers here. So you know he just he just was on a different track. Yeah. And it's it's hard to blame Lennon McCartney in 1969 for the track George Harrison was taking 64 because it all runs its course. Yeah. You know, I mean, well, you know, uh, Dave Grohl was a songwriter when he was in Nirvana, mm-hmm. but he said, you know, Nirvana is Kurt songs and the stuff I'm writing doesn't really fit with what we're doing. So, you know, obviously he didn't know Kurt was going to die, but he may have sure. thought that at some point he might have formed the Foo Fighters as a, as a secondary thing to Nirvana and use his songs. So, a lot of these things, they, they could be more practical than emotional, but you yeah, know, very true. we don't know, do we? <laughs> we don't know. But we can make our best guesses. <laughs> well, let's yeah. move on to the next point here. Um, this was another topic from the Get Back film and talking about the cinematic filmmaking that Jackson utilized to, I think, as you mentioned earlier, to create drama. And this is what filmmakers do. This is their job. And I, I don't often like to see people hold it against Jackson, but where were you, where were you going with uh, your initial thought on this? No, I, I thought he pitched it just about right. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. I guess the examples, the bit where Paul says, and then there were two, and then he's kind of tearing up. I mean, it was an incredible moment to see Paul McCartney, you know, that vulnerable, let's oh, say. Yeah. And I, I had this funny thing when I was watching him, and I was saying this to the Two Legs guys, I, he suddenly looked, he looked like the teenage Paul McCartney. He looked like the Hamburg Paul McCartney, just with a mm. beard. There's ah. something in his eyes. He's, he, he looked like a kind mm. of a lost child. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure a million people have said that, but like I say, I, I've been purposely not reading no, too I haven't many heard reviews that. and things. I haven't heard it quite put that way, but I can see your point. Because yeah, you, you probably felt very alone at that moment. Or this is, yeah, gonna, you, this is like, dude, this is going to fall apart. <laughs> this, is, this is not going well. Yeah, and I mean, it's another argument for Paul isn't dead as well, which we'll, for later, I know. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you look at the pictures of Paul in Hamburg and then compare it with that, there's something in the eyes. Yeah, he, he just looked, it's almost like the beard and everything was covering uh, what was really going on. Yeah, I mean, that was a great moment. That's a cinematic moment. And the fact that, you know, John did appear an hour later or whatever, or he talked to him on the phone like two minutes later, mm-hmm. it doesn't really matter because it's a moment, you know, and as you said, you know, they signed Peter Jackson, for God's sake, who is a filmmaker, who, yes. you know, who made Lord of the Rings. I mean, that's not realistic, is it? So, But it, it would be <laughs> foolish to tie Jackson's hands to tell him to not use that, that, that you wouldn't do that. I mean, and the yeah. thing I've brought up on some, some other topics in discussing this film was the fact that having listened to all the Nagar reels gives you some wonderful information that if you don't listen to that, people don't have to add to yeah. whatever narrative. But to have the film to go with it, my goodness, the, what is told by seeing it. You can't yes. see McCartney tearing up from hearing the Nagar reels. Can't do it. Exactly. And there's a lot of those moments that I noticed for me personally where, like, wow, the seeing is believing. 
So, but he didn't I, overdo it. But he didn't overdo it. That's that's to his credit. Yeah, I don't there think weren't he too did many either. I thought the "Isn't It a Pity" was fantastic. You know, playing George's. It was and a I find, I find more and more. You know, I prefer his stripped down versions to the ones that all things must pass. I find that more and more. The All Things Must Pass song, that's really the lost one. And as you, you made a video, obviously, saying they didn't reject it, which I, I totally get. But it's such a shame they didn't finish that, because that would have... Imagine that on Abbey Road, you know, get rid of... I don't, I don't rag on Maxwell as much as some people, but I still could say you yeah, could take out Maxwell or O'Darling and stick All Things Must Pass, and Completely. Abbey Road's even greater. But Completely. So I like that. And I mentioned earlier in the first part, Heather's reaction to Yoko. I mean, that's brilliant. Who cares if that wasn't her reaction? We're never going to know. Well, I think it's that was also comic relief. I mean, we have the Beatles giving comic relief. It's really nice to hear, have Heather, such an innocent person. Brilliant. Giving, giving, brilliant. That, that's, that was so great. And because yeah. it, 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 the innocence gives it that much more credibility of as course. opposed to a joke maybe told by Michael Lindsay Hogg, you know. Yeah. And my favorite moment, quite a few. and my favorite feel good moment and again, this shows how wonderful Ringo is. It's actually in the original Let It Be film. You can look at it on YouTube, a five-second clip, when Heather bangs the drum. Yes. The symbol, and Ringo goes, <gasps> yeah. she goes, ah! Such a great moment, because, you know, Ringo is already a father. He's obviously good with kids. Paul was good with kids as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, he put in yeah, those even, light moments. And even John is is fooling around with her a little bit, and it's just, it, it, made, it, it made them more human. And to yeah. utilize that, I thought, was good good filmmaking yeah and imagine poor old julian as well watching that i mean he he's already seen you know magical mystery tour and john's playing with the kid and he's blowing yeah. up the balloons and john's like brilliant with her he's like the, the coolest yeah. dad ever and i'm sure he was good with sean so poor old julian he's thinking oh he's good with everyone except me it seems <laughs> and, uh, um but yeah, yeah I, th I think he i think he pitched it right what about the krishnas as well well, that was also good to see because you don't hear the Krishnas talking. And, uh, you know, the, the jokes, and we'll talk about this later, but the constant throughout all that month, the constant referring back to the earlier history. You yeah. Know, ah, who's that little man over there? Well, I don't know, but he's very clean, isn't he? That's brilliant. Who's that little like, old man? It was not, Love it was it. almost uh, not quite nonstop that, but every day you get some of that. And it's really, that to me is... I don't think they were, they weren't doing it for the cameras. I think that's just how they talk with one another. Yeah. That's what I mean. It's like a reality show. Cause it's almost like they're in the big brother house. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I watched the, the original big brother wasn't too bad. And then after a while you could see that they were just creating drama, mm -hmm. but you know, the original conceit of that, this sort of reality TV, which is not mm -hmm. quite real, but, there must be a point where you, over a course of a day, you do forget about the camera now and again. Yeah. Or with the Beatles, they probably thought, well, we've had cameras on us for the last 10 years. What's the bloody difference? You know, they yeah, had someone yeah. poking a camera at them every day of their life. So, you know, who cares? And, yeah. I mean, and there clearly were moments when they said they knew, there were moments when they let the audience know that they knew the cameras were on and they were pulling punches. And then there's mm. one great moment. It's when... Paul and George have the argument. So Lindsay Hogg has got the camera perched above looking down on them. This is, this is just great camera work. Mm. And McCartney stops himself from it escalating. And he gets up out of his chair and walks, starts pacing. Yeah. Paces toward John and John goes, forget about candid camera. In, in, in essence saying, go, Paul. Say what you need to say. Yeah. And he did. And then George responded. It all blew over. But that to me was a great moment. And I, I heard that on the, on the Nagger Reels, but I didn't see the body movement. And the, mm. the body language is so wonderful to see. Yeah. And so I, I do believe that these guys, they just can't help but be honest with at least some of what we saw. I mean, sure, that they, they were cautious and, and didn't get, show us everything. But... Mm. There's times they certainly did. Yeah, it was on a show last year, actually. We reviewed Hard Day's Night, and it was kind of a comedic podcast, kind of making fun of old films, but we were still mm -hmm. making serious points. And I was making the point that it's, it's very weird. Like In the early days, they, they were both natural and performing at the same time because they got in this thing, this rhythm, you know, this sort of wise-cracking rhythm that you get at the press mm -hmm. conferences, the early ones anyway. Yeah. 
So they're, they're kind of being natural, but I'm sure if you're a famous person, you learn to sort of protect yourself very quickly mm -hmm. by sort of being candid up to a point and giving, you know, the reporters what they want. But then you're obviously going to be holding stuff back. But um, I think maybe by this point, I think particularly John Lennon, he's obviously going through this stage, just met Yoko. He's trying to be as real as he can. So, you know, he's going to tell them, oh, you know, I got really high last night and I was doing this and that. And, you know, yeah, who, cares about, think, who cares about the camera? You know, it's been on me for 10 years anyway. So, yeah, and I think there's maybe even be fair to that. say that Lennon was performing for Yoko as well on some other level. Yeah, could be. And yeah. that's something that doesn't get talked about a lot. And, you know, and just in front of his bandmates when the cameras weren't there as well. You know, he's, he's yeah. trying to show her something or, you know, in his own way, support her or whatever. And um, I think that's also part of the cinematography within the band. <laughs> I mean, what guy in their twenties doesn't want to impress their new girlfriend? Exactly. Especially if they think she might be the one, you know. Right. She, they, arguably, she was. You know, we can, that's a Goldman or Goldman thing, which uh, you know, <laughs> we'll do yeah, another I mean, time. <laughs> again, again, we come back to the ages of these guys and how young they yeah. were. Well, how what was I acting like when I was 25, 26? Like, yeah, I'm not. It's not as mature. <laughs> as I am now, that's for sure. But these guys, certainly, they, we've talked about how much live life they lived in that short span and it aged them and matured them mm. well beyond their years. And we yeah. do see that as well. So I think a lot of people were impressed by that, how young they were and how they handled all this. So yeah, yeah I think that's, uh, I'm, I'm glad uh, we get to see that. I mean, George is like the oldest 25 year old in the house, isn't he? Yeah, Michael Lindsay. I think Michael Lindsay Hope was born in 1940, the same as yeah. John and Ringo. Correct. So you've also got a director who's not even 30 either. You know, and um, yeah. just a quick point about that. A lot of people, I have heard a lot of people sort of saying, "Oh, he comes across as really annoying," but I, I quite like him actually. I think he's. I think he had a lot of it on the Nagra reels. I remember thinking, "Oh, he's got loads of interesting stuff to say." He's obviously totally. quite culturally, he's quite culturally knowledgeable as well. So. I completely agree. I think Hogg gets way, people are too tough on him and mm. they suggest that he's annoying with some of his jokes. I, I, from what I read, Hogg is going toward to with these guys cultured from, from a cultured standpoint in Sway in London, he's in that circle mm. and he's got a bit of a pedigree with Orson Welles being his father, which is alluded to in the film. Mm. Um, so he brings his own level of gravitas and he, his suggestions are, are good. He he knows music. He's a very well-rounded guy. And he's got some very, and his sense of humor is not like the Beatles necessarily, but he's got his own that stands up quite well. So yeah, yeah I'm, I've, I became more of a fan of his. Because, and he, look, the task he had to have four Beatles basically direct the film, he had, it was tough for him to walk on those eggshells. Yeah, it must be so difficult every day to say, uh, well, uh, what about the show, lads? Well, you know? Look at Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson had carte blanche to make his film. Hogg did not. He, he knew he, he his job was on the line. His reputation was on the line. He had to make something. How can you not make something great with the Beatles? Well, he got very close to making nothing with them if it went the way of the Rock and Roll Circus with Rolling Stones. And, mm. you know, it's just that the, the bosses were just too close to the subject matter, I think. And, you know, Hogg still shot great stuff because that's what Jackson had to work with. And he that's directed Rock and Roll Circus, did he? Pardon? He directed Rock and Roll Circus. Yeah. Oh, God, I've forgotten about that. Wow. Because he directed the Jumpy Jack Flash music video, which is fantastic. Correct. It's nice. yep. and, and then obviously, Jude, hey, Jude. So, I mean, great stuff. Maybe he was the wrong guy for that, but I don't know who the right guy would have been. You know, I mean, I mean, the Beatles just came so unprepared. I mean, who could have done as well as Hogg? Maybe nobody. I mean, I think because Hogg was yeah. so young, he had the energy he had. He was just immature enough to mm. capture what he did in the way he did. I think maybe they could have got like a real no-nonsense guy, almost like a John Lennon type of person, but someone who'd stand Otto up. Preminger. To... Otto Preminger. Otto Preminger. God, can you imagine that? That'd be a... Kubrick. Yeah. yeah. How about Kubrick? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I don't think any of that would have worked. The only no, thing no, they would have hired a guy. Like, they would have hired a guy they could push around, which was Lindsay. Yeah, Lennon. maybe. Uh, yeah. I mean, they pushed around George Martin, who is their elder. Right, right. Yeah, he has a curious role, doesn't he? It's not. It's never quite, never quite clear what's happening with that. But that was an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. I think George Martin and Glyn Johns. I mean, they're both kind of. 
And we know George Martin was actually very working class, but I think he he sort of acquired a, a kind of more upper class bearing. And mm -hmm. Lynn John sounds very posh, so I can imagine them being very polite. Yeah. yeah, kind of a dandy is Glenn Johns. Eh? Yeah. All those outfits, his big glasses and his fur coat, and everything. Yeah, he won. Glenn Johns clearly hands down wins the fashion awards of the get. Yeah, it's like a really, it's like a posh hippie, isn't he? Going, oh, I, I would say he, and then maybe Maureen Starkey has a couple yeah. of interesting outfits. George, he was a bit of a dandy in some of those uh, frilly shirts he had on, and the bow ties as well. The bow tie. He has a purple bow tie. And John mm -hmm. has a black bow tie. Yeah. Yeah. But um. Yeah, talking about this cinematic thing. Yeah, I think if you think of it as a sort of reality show slash soap opera mm. slash I don't know drama. Yeah, it kind of works. Yeah, that's work. I was really happy with it to be honest. Um, uh, now the rooftop. A um, lot of mixed feelings on how Hogg finished up the film. Uh, so from a cinematic standpoint, I loved it. Um, what What was your take on? Uh, so we talk about Jackson. How, yeah, Jackson or, how he presented uh, it. Um, I th I think if we didn't have the Let It Be film, we might feel like we've missed out a bit, perhaps, because by having that split screen and cutting between two things, you're not getting the whole thing, in a sense. Correct. But because the Let It Be film had already covered it so well anyway, and for what I remember of the Let It Be film, it was pretty much just straight, wasn't it? The camera was in front of them, yeah, with a few close-ups here and there, obviously. Some some low shots, um, yeah, some guy on his back. You know, the, those how use some good shots. And let yeah. me just interject here: those mm. sixty hours everybody wants to see would include all the takes of all ten cameras being used at the rooftop concert. All right. So yeah. good luck with that, people. <laughs> <laughs> I'd watch it though. Watch <laughs> I would too, but just once, just once. I would watch it too, but I think they, they were expecting to get some enlightening thing that Peter Jackson is not showing us and keeping us from the truth. Right. So you think he pretty much in eight hours, he probably gave us the highlights we needed, would you say? I probably. do. I think he could that's have probably done it in six hours, but um, that's not to say we would have, might not have, we may have lost out on some little tidbits and anecdotal things here and there, which we always love. And you can having. Oh. Go ahead. Have, to answer your question, having the, the sort of more straight rooftop gig in Let It Be already, mm -hmm. then I was fine with having, because now we've got two, you know, I don't really say either or, because I thought the rooftop was arguably the best moment of the original yeah. film. Oh, yeah. I thought the rooftop was amazing, and, and I actually found it quite moving, because it's, you realise, you know, you notice when John did um, Hope We Pass the Audition, and yeah. we didn't see before, when it's right on him, you see him sort of hugging his guitar to his chest, which is kind of what performers do. You know, mm -hmm. to say goodbye, mm -hmm. everybody. Hope you enjoyed the show. And then, uh, you know, within 20 seconds, 30 seconds, they're, they're all, they're pretty much all gone, you know. Partly because it's cold, probably. Again, we don't want to read too much into it. It's bloody mm -hmm. freezing. So yeah. as soon as it's over, you know, George is well out the door and Billy's out the door. And within a minute, they've all, they've all gone. Mm -hmm. And I found the rooftop almost like a magical 45 minutes because we know everything that happened afterwards. And yeah. Again, you know, I was just saying to you earlier, I don't know if it was off mic or on mic, but there were good moments, you know, the Ballad of John Yoko and you're probably relatively happy during Abbey Road. But I think really, to be perfectly honest, I think when when all the court, the Klein and Eastman stuff started, that was really that was really when the rot set in. So I think the rooftop was a was a glorious forty five minutes of performance and brotherhood and I absolutely loved it. Yes. And having the original film, as I said, I didn't feel like we've missed out. And I loved all the stuff with PC Dag and he wasn't taking any shit at all. He was like, oh, we've had 30 complaints. You know, I don't care if he's a Beatles, get him to turn the bloody noise down. You know? <laughs> and the stuff in the street, you know, just seeing the fashions of that day. And, sure. You know, the businessman going, oh, I shouldn't disrupt all the business. I mean, you can't get more <laughs> of a stereotypical uptight businessman than that. You know, mm -hmm. so I, th I thought that was... If I had to point to anything, that would be my favorite part of the film, but partly just because of the music, you know, the performances, you know? Yes, I mean, the performances are great. I, I It didn't occur to me till more recently that they were recording that. That was being, yeah. that was the cables were going down below and that those are performances we were seeing was what was on the album in many cases. And it's like, mm. that's incredible. That's an incredible, uh, uh, that's some good fine playing. And let me say also as well, um, 
I'm sure you know this, but the two songs that they didn't do extra takes of, which is Digger Pony and One After 909, mm -hmm. which, you know, objectively you probably say are the weakest songs in terms of songwriting, but they're arguably the best performances. I think, you know, George's work on One After 909, those licks, are, I mean, that, that's up with, I'd say that's up with Clapton and yeah Beckham. harrison's playing on those songs i mean even on it i want i've got a feeling i mean yeah he, playing is fine great and on big a pony yeah. it's right in there and it's so important to the song yeah but when john's singing on Digga, you know all i want is you he's mm. really like you know he's going for it and yeah i'd say arguably they're, they're the best two performances because they didn't need any more takes you know get back yeah. has never been one of my favorite songs yeah it's a great song so so I think that that moment where Paul's composing it is great to see something that never existed suddenly in 10 minutes. It's not quite there, but on the way. But I think if it had been another song that was probably one of my favorites, that would have been an even more magic moment. Yeah, you know? for sure. But, um, but yeah, just to say the cinematic things, I think you pitched it about right. You know, There's yeah, enough I... drama, a bit of comedy, but it, it's not too contrived. I think something like the Ron Howard one, I mean, that was, you know, the eight days a week. It just... Yeah. It just yeah. seemed all a, it just seemed too aimed at the casual fan. Well, it, it, you know, it I mean, I, I mean, that's putting it very kindly, I think. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I well, maybe we'll talk about that in another video. I have a have a nice little field day with old Ron Howard's film. But um, <laughs> I, yeah. the rooftop for me and get and get back uh, from a cinematic standpoint, I thought was fantastic. I love the split screens. I love, I mean, talk about efficient filmmaking, efficient storytelling mm. and utilizing all the 10 cameras that were being used at the time, I thought was great. Mm. Now, I can't help but be slightly affected by the feedback I get from people who watch my channel here. And there was, you know, a good number of people felt jobbed that, oh, we didn't see the performances of Let It Be, Long Winding Road, and two of us the following day or so. We didn't see full performances on the rooftop. And like you said, we do have the original Let It Be film. I don't know. I didn't feel shortchanged by that. I don't need to see every little, I mean, it would be, if you did see the entire rooftop, it would be edited. So it's not like you're going to see every camera angle. I mean, at some point you got to say enough is enough or good enough is good enough. And yeah. um, for me, I thought Jackson hit it out of the park. Now to show the recordings of Long and Winding Road and let it be over the credits. I mean, he had to bring this thing in for a landing at some point. You had to end yeah. it. At some point. He got yeah. about, yeah. I mean, his original cut was 18 hours. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I was okay with it. But again, remember, we've got them from the original film. Okay, mm -hmm. they're, okay they're not in the great, the best quality. But, yeah. you know, I'm sure that I feel like we're probably going to get a cleaned up Let It Be. I think that's... So, th so then, then we're sorted, you know. We'll yeah. have the rooftop, we'll have those three, and between the two of them, I'm sure rabid fans like us would, be, would snap up both, you know, bring out a big DVD, I'm there, you know. Yeah. And then we got the complete set. Yeah, you know, I did, when I watched it, I was thinking, oh, you know, perhaps they could have had longer performances, but... Like you say, if they were already out there in the world, then he, he's almost, I think Jackson's almost filling in the gaps of the hog film rather than repeating it, you know? Yes. I think, which is a good, good thing to do. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was, we knew how it was going to end and it was still fascinating. Yeah. Well, you know, ends with the rooftop. It, just, it was great. So, But also the other the other thing was um, the, those guys on, on the other roof heckling, mm. I mean, heckling in a, in a nice way. You know, they say rock and roll, and John says, same to you, <laughs> and stuff like that. And Paul's sort of waving over to them, and it's, it's very Ruttles in a funny way. Yeah, yeah, you it know? was. <laughs> With the cops and everything, it was very yeah. Ruttles like. And then people yeah. remind him, oh, I, I don't know, I, I don't know where they are. I don't, where, I don't know where that's coming from, you know. It was it was very Ruttles like. Yeah, do you notice when Paul first saw the policeman and then just went like, woo, into the mic? <laughs> he knew that it was going to help the ending. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah, my friend pointed that out to me. That was hilarious. Yeah. And the, and the shots of Yoko that again were in Let It Be. In. And as you said, the, this weirdly impassive sort of. She's got this ability to, you know. I mean, some people would point to drugs. I don't think it was that really. I think it's just she's got this amazing ability to just sort of sit for hours with, with one expression, and you can see she's she's really got no interest in the music, which is fair enough. Although she did do some pretty good rock and roll. She, she became like a rock and roll granny, you know, when she was in her 60s. And 
Yeah. She had a band with Sean, and I actually liked quite a lot of her rock mm-hmm. and roll. I mean, I like mm-hmm. the, um, I liked the uh, the album she made. I can't remember. I like it so much. I can't remember. Uh, approximately Infinite Universe and yeah. Feeling the Space. It's good mm-hmm. rock and roll, you know. So. Yeah, some of that is quite her early '70s stuff is is good. I mean, it's it's worthwhile yeah. for sure. Yeah, people forget that she made five or six albums on Apple, and she wrote most of them. So she. She wrote single-handedly five, six albums. People don't yeah. realize that she was outperforming her husband in quantity <laughs> yeah. and in some cases, perhaps quality too. Sure, yeah. And um, that's another topic for another video, but I think that's a, a, a fair comment. You know, she, she had some chops. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's end it right there. We've got um, one more video to go after this one. Yeah, so yeah. let's tell the audience where they can find your podcasts and the name of them. Sure. Glass Onion, I'm John Lennon. Life and Life Only and Film Gold in all the usual places. Everywhere you find good podcasts. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you sir. And we'll be back with part three with Antonio Rutuno. Mm-hmm.